Paradise postponed. COVID restrictions will remain in place for an extra month. By July the 19th, it's thought two thirds of us will have had both jabs, enough to slow the spread of the virus. And says the PM, for life to start to resume. By being cautious now, we have the chance in the next four weeks to save many thousands of lives. There is at least some relief for couples waiting to get married, but for hospitality businesses already on the brink, it is a bitter blow. All these businesses that can't open have incurred huge, huge expenditure over the last few days to now have the rug pulled under the last minute, and it's not fair. So I'm afraid some are still on hold for many of us as we count down the weeks until July the 19th. We have all the details of the latest announcement. Also tonight, great expectations dashed Scotland's disappointing debut at the Euros. And the remarkable bravery of the young woman who took on a crocodile to save her twin sister. I was trying to beat it on the, on the nose and it came and I had to bite it, beat it off with the other. This is the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale. Good evening. The Prime Minister tonight put the brakes on the full lifting of lockdown restrictions in England, delaying it for a further four weeks. Boris Johnson said infections caused by the Delta variant are rising rapidly and that a growing number of patients are seriously ill. He said it is sensible to wait until July the 19th and give the NHS a crucial few weeks to vaccinate millions more people and save lives. Here's our political correspondent, Carl Dinan. It's just as well the sun's been out because the remaining restrictions in Clacton in Essex, as across the rest of England, are staying put. The Prime Minister, for the first time, delaying a step in his roadmap. I think it is sensible to wait just a little longer. I'm confident that we will not need more than four weeks and we won't need to go beyond July the 19th. But now is the time to ease off the accelerator. The concern is that in northwest England, infections are now doubling every week and hospitalisations are starting to ramp up. Although we do not think an immediate uh, overwhelming of the NHS is likely, if this continues on an exponential path, and in particular, if that then accelerated further due to further loosenings, uh, then we would run into trouble. Although the Prime Minister is delaying the lifting of restrictions in England until the 19th of July, he's open to lifting them on the 5th if the data suddenly improves. Events like weddings are the main exception. From June the 21st, they can have more than 30 guests if the venue capacity allows it. And the piloting of crowds at big events like the Euros will continue. But there will be no extra support for businesses during the delay. Some of the support that you currently have in place for businesses starts to reduce during this four-week delay. Why aren't you keeping support and protections in place at the level that they're at now? Looking at the, the data that I can see now, looking at the, the scale of the vaccine uh, rollout, I, I'm pretty confident that July the 19th will be, as it were, a, a terminus date and that uh, we'll be able to take things, uh, take things forward from there. And there's political anger that this diversion has had to be inserted into the roadmap by the variant from India. This virus is surging because Boris Johnson left the back door open and allowed the variant to wash up on our shores. He was complacent, he differed and he didn't take action until it was too late. But Labour will support the delay in Parliament and back in Clacton there's a feeling that things could be worse. We've been in it for long enough so... Another yeah. four weeks wouldn't make too much difference, but... As long as it doesn't go backwards, like back into an actual full lockdown, as long as things still stay open, I think. I'm pretty happy with how life is now, apart from not being able to go on holiday. But um, when the weather's like this, you know, well, I'll take England any day. <laughs> so it's another five weeks until restrictions are lifted, meaning more pain for some, whilst others find ways to make their own fun. Carl Dinan, ITV News, Westminster.
Well, the extra delay will be a bitter blow for businesses, especially as the Prime Minister says there will be no extra financial help. Many pubs, theatres and nightclubs are barely hanging on and they really fear another four weeks of restrictions could force them to close for good. Juliet Bremner heard from affected businesses in Liverpool. Stocking up for what should have been a football bonanza. At this city centre pub in Liverpool, they have a cellar full of beer, but will only be allowed to serve a reduced crowd of customers. It's a big deal. To all these businesses that can't open have incurred huge, huge expenditure over the last few days to now have the rug pulled under the last minute, and it's not fair. Fiona Hornsby went further, accusing the government of hypocrisy at their G7 meeting. They're having a barbecue on the beach and they're all standing up. There, there was no social distancing. There was clearly more than 30 people at the event. Now, if that was here in our little beer garden outside and we had anybody standing up with no masks on, we would be uh, fined or closed. After this test event in Liverpool in April, public health officials declared nightclubs safe. The decision to keep them closed has been a financial blow. It's catastrophic, really. Yeah, we're ready to go. We've got plans from the 24th of June, that first Friday. We've got a sold out 12 capacity gig ready to go. Now we're not going to be able to do that. All our staff who are preparing to come back, who are excited to finally get back to work, are not going to be able to come back to work now. All the stock we've bought, we're not sure what we're going to do about that now. At the Everyman Theatre, they're worried that no mention was made of further arts funding. We can only take a fraction of our audiences in for every performance. Now, this is not a sustainable model. It's not economic, of course. If you don't have this arts funding, are you going to be able to survive? We wouldn't be able to keep the staffing that we've got. We just wouldn't be able to open. Like so many businesses, they have adapted, but worn without continued support, the show simply can't go on. Juliet Bremner, ITV News, Liverpool. Now, there was, as we heard earlier, some brighter news for couples about to get married in England. Rules are being relaxed, allowing some finally to get hitched in front of many of their family and friends. Now, the 30-person limit for weddings is to be lifted, but some restrictions will remain in place. Venues will have the maximum capacity limited to allow for social distancing. It will be table service only, with indoor tables limited to six people. Dancing is not going to be allowed indoors and not recommended outdoors and masks must be worn when not sitting down. Well, Martha Fairley heard from one couple who hope it means their big day will still go ahead. Max and Clarice's wedding in a rural barn last September was postponed because of Covid. This is all wedding. <laughs> They've kept the decorations, drinks and favours for 138 guests in storage, hoping things were heading in the right direction for their rescheduled big day on July the 3rd. It's been so up and down with what we, we will be able to do and it's been all so speculative. It's um, been horrible. We've had sort of a lot of sleepless nights. Weddings I mean, the can still go ahead no. with uh, more than 30 guests, provided, pro provided social distancing remains in place. But even after watching the PM's announcement, they're not much clearer. It leaves us with a really busy, busy morning, speaking to all our suppliers and seeing if there's any way we can do our wedding lawfully. And yet another delay to lifting restrictions on distancing and dancing is a blow to both venues like Copdock Hall near Ipswich and their suppliers. Probably best described as a nightmare and probably Groundhog Day, actually. It seems to be repeating itself every month, every couple of months. Yeah, it, it, it's been a, a living hell. We need to ring the manager now to get all our drinks ordered. But having chosen an outdoor wedding reception, it is better news for Phil and Hannah, who will now tie the knot in July. Bittersweet, really. Like We're happy because obviously it feels like we can go ahead of our day. Bitter, it's not going to be exactly what we wanted it to be. It won't quite be the wedding of their dreams, but finally for them, celebrating with all their guests can become a reality. Martha Fairley, ITV News. So my political editor Robert Peston is here. So Robert, we've heard the Prime Minister's announcement. How difficult will this decision have been for him to make? Well, and how much of a political impact might it have upon him? Well, it's been a hideous decision for him, partly because he's never liked taking away our freedoms. He's resisted pretty much every lockdown. So he wanted to end this one uh, on the date that he originally promised. And the other reason why he'll hate it is because he'll be cursing himself uh, in the sense that 
many would say he's only got himself to blame because, as Chris Whitty, the chief medical officer, said, the reason why the lockdown uh, restrictions are going on for another four weeks is all because of this Delta variant, which is surging. It's completely displaced the Kent or Alpha variant. That Delta variant came from India. And, you know, frankly, there are many people who, in my view, uh, cogently argue that we, the reason the Delta variant is running rife in this country is because the Prime Minister put India on the red list a number of weeks too late. We saw India infections going up very strongly, and it wasn't until late April the 23rd until the Prime Minister, as I say, in a sense, closed the door on travel from India. And we are suffering worse from this variant than other countries. So, yes, personally, very difficult for him. And because this is a mistake, many will say a political, a lot of political damage for him as well. OK, Robert, thank you. Well, the other UK nations will be deciding their next steps very soon. In Northern Ireland, restrictions are also expected to ease on June the 21st, but that will be reviewed on Thursday. Scotland will announce any further relaxations on June the 28th. And in Wales, lockdown measures will be reviewed on June the 21st. And to find out more about exactly what's going on where you live, go to itv.com forward slash news. Scotland's long-awaited return to top-flight international men's football ended in a sobering home defeat today. A wonder goal from the halfway line helped the Czech Republic win 2-0 at Hampden Park. It now sets up a crucial game for the Scots against England on Friday. Garrett Vincent was with the fans in Glasgow. A generation of Scottish footballers has come and gone since the last time Scotland's men played football in an international tournament. So Flower of Scotland was belted out this afternoon and Hampden Park swelled with pride as they took to the biggest stage once again. This Scottish team contains real quality and they made the early running. Captain Andy Robertson should have put them into the lead. The Czechs soaked up the pressure and then applied some of their own. Patrick Schick rose high to head the first goal home. And then came an early contender for goal of the tournament. Schick, again, seeing Scotland's goalkeeper off his line, struck the ball perfectly from halfway up the pitch. Hampden was struck silent as David Marshall followed the ball into the net. Scotland never gave up and throughout the second half they created chance after chance, but to no avail. A milestone moment in the history of Scottish football, but try as they might, Scotland's players couldn't make it their own. And as if that showdown against England on Friday wasn't a big enough game already, well, Scotland's future in this tournament may now depend on it. Right until the end, they kept going, they kept pushing, yeah, but they just couldn't get through the defence. So. To be fair, the checks were good. But we're not out. We can go to Wembley and we can get something down there. And then we've got Croatia back here. Three or four points out of those two games, we're still in it. No problem. Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll be a bit more optimistic come Friday with a few more drinks in me. <laughs> Never before have Scotland made it to the latter stages of a major tournament. There's still some hope in a day which began by promising so much, but it ends with the fans facing the prospect of an early exit once again. Geraint Vincent, ITV News, Hampden Park. Still to come, the Eye of Evening News, the report into why the BBC rehired Martin Bashir after that Diana interview. And she actually told me that she thought this is the way that she's going to die. Well, that's an incredible story of the twins who were attacked by a crocodile and lived to tell the tale, the tale and the amazing interview and plenty more after the break. Hello again, welcome back. Now, if you have received a scam text, email or message recently, you are definitely not alone. Citizens Advice estimates around 36 million of us have been targeted this year alone. Those aged over 55 are most at risk. And today, ITV News spoke to one victim who was fleeced for £120,000. Here's our consumer editor, Chris Choi. Emails, texts and phone calls are scams surge. Now new figures reveal how fraudsters are cashing in on crisis. 
Theresa Jackson had £120,000 taken when a social media advert led her into a Bitcoin scam. Though her bank refunded some, she's been devastated. I knew that everything is gone. In terms of my family, they, you know, they trusted me to know what I was doing. So I knew I was going to have to face them as well, my partner, my daughters. So it was really awful. Today's new figures from Citizens Advice show 36 million people in the UK targeted by scammers so far this year. Scams reported more than doubled. The most common are fake deliveries or parcels, fake government messages and scam investments. Scammers are using the, the situation of us being locked down, using the internet a lot more, using our phones a lot more. Professional scammers use all kinds of tricks to get hold of our cash. Despite public awareness campaigns like this, scams have moved up a gear. But this senior fraud officer says police are having success. Alongside pandemic, we now have this epidemic of scams. What are you doing to up your game and catch some of these villains? 90,000 websites have been taken down this year as a result of reporting into the service. We've arrested 150 people committing key offences during the pandemic. But still, these frauds are flowing in. The pandemic devastated many livelihoods, but has delivered a lucrative bonus for criminals. Chris Choi, ITV News. The boyfriend of one of the two sisters who was stabbed to death has described the horrifying moment he discovered their bodies. Adam Stone told a jury he screamed and fell to his knees when he found Nicole Smallman and Bebar Henry hidden in bushes after a party in a North London park for Miss Henry's birthday. Danielle Hussain denies murder. Sussex police say they have arrested a 17-year-old boy on suspicion of criminal damage at a football ground in Uckfield. Two people were caught on CCTV vandalising a defibrillator kit at Buxted Football Club in the early hours of Sunday morning. And if you found the temperatures unbearable today, you won't be surprised to learn it was the hottest day of the year so far, with a temperature topping 28 degrees Celsius at Heathrow. Not bad for those of us those of you who got to go to the beach though. Now, a BBC review has found no evidence that the rehiring of the controversial journalist Martin Bashir was part of a cover-up. The internal inquiry cleared senior staff saying no one involved knew the methods Bashir had used to secure his now infamous panorama interview with Princess Diana in 1995. And our arts editor Nina Nana is here. So the BBC has cleared itself of any wrongdoing. I suppose the gist of it is, if only we'd known then what we know now. Um, as you say, this is an internal inquiry by the BBC trying to work out how and why Martin Bashir, when at least the knowledge that he'd used fake documents in the run-up to that interview with Princess Diana in 1995, the knowledge was out there, some people were aware of it. Why was he rehired as religious affairs correspondent by the BBC in 2016 and promoted to religion editor um, two years later in 2018? Now, the report today, as as you say, has found that there's absolutely no evidence that this was part of a, a, a wider cover-up of any deception surrounding events surrounding that interview. Um, and he was simply hired because he was the best man for the job. Um, and th it did have some criticism. It did say that those sitting on the interview panel perhaps should have interviewed further um, investigated further other controversies involving Mar Martin Bashir when he went to work at two US networks that due diligence wasn't necessarily done in that case. Well, the Director General of the BBC, Tim Davey, has responded to that report and uh, this is what he had to say. I'm not excusing it. I'm just saying that it's easy with hindsight. But what really, what really has happened here is we now know the level of deception, the level of problems in that original securing of the interview and that's where the problem lies. Well, responding to that report, uh, Princess Diana's brother, Ill Spencer, went on Twitter and said, it won't end with this, I promise. And he's right, because tomorrow, three former, um, three director generals, two of them former, will be interviewed by MPs on the Culture Committee. OK, Nina Nana, thank you. Footballer Christian Eriksen says he feels better in his first public statement since suffering a cardiac arrest during Denmark's opening Euro 2020 game. The 29-year-old went on to thank fans for their support, saying he wouldn't give up. He collapsed on the pitch shortly before half-time on Saturday, but is now in a stable condition as he recovers in hospital. 
And finally tonight, the twin who saved her sister from the jaws of a crocodile has told IDB News how she fought the animal off. Georgia Laurie described how she repeatedly beat the croc on the nose when it tried to drag her sister Melissa away. Emma Murphy reports on their incredible escape. The tear on Melissa Laurie's nose is the only obvious sign of the crocodile attack, which would have killed her had it not been for her twin sister. Yet beneath the gown, she has multiple bite wounds, so severe she had to be placed in a coma to allow her body to recover from sepsis. As her sister improves, Georgia Laurie has told of the moment the crocodile attacked. We saw the crocodile and we tried to swim to, to safety, but um, unfortunately my sister didn't, um, didn't escape that. Um, so yeah, it took her under. Um, she actually told me that she thought this is the way that she's going to die and she wasn't, she was really scared. The girls had checked with their German tour guide that it was safe to swim in this Mexican lagoon in the minutes before the attack. And dragged her body towards me, laid her on my chest, tried to revive her and um, she started going into a fit and the crocodile came back twice. So I beat it off. Um, but the third time is when I sustained the most injuries. Um, that's from when I was, I was trying to beat it <laughs> on, the, on the nose and it came and I had to bite, beat it off with the other, other fist. Um, Cause it was trying to death roll her, right? And try and drag her away. Just the adrenaline kicked in and I, I didn't even feel, feel any pain from when it bit me. Um, I was just focusing purely on her. The girls were pulled onto a boat as Melissa slipped in and out of consciousness. She remembers it dragging her underwater and um, she remembers feeling like she was going to drown. And also she said she felt like her arm was ripped off. Um, she said the only other thing that she remembers is me singing to her on the boat. Georgia sang throughout that journey as she and her sister had throughout their backpacking trip, a trip they hope will continue once Melissa is well enough. Emma Murphy, ITV News. Wow, that's it for now. Tom's here at 10. From me and all the team, bye-bye.